uh, my co-authors here, Nancy Alberry and Janet Franklin, will uh, let you know what we've learned on Abaco. And here's the uh, acknowledgement slide. I really want to thank all these institutions here, especially the National Museum of the Bahamas. They've really uh, facilitated uh, our research a lot. And uh, we keep coming back to the Bahamas because it's such a great place to work. OK, so here we are somewhere about like right there, this map of the, of the Caribbean. And the Bahamas are, sit in an unusual situation, very close to North America, not quite part of the Greater Antilles, geologically very young, never connected directly to any Greater Antillean Island or any or to North America. So by default, whatever got here to the Bahamas has colonized over, over water. And where this gets really interesting is if you look at the last, I don't know, million, but let's focus maybe on the last half million years with glacial interglacial cycles, with each cycle, each set of a glacial and interglacial taking up about 100,000 years and about 85 to 90 percent of the time in the last half million years, and I use half million because the Bahamas may not be any older than that. Like I said, it's geologically young. About 85, 90 percent of the time has been glacial, not interglacial. So the period that we're in now, even though we're all worried about climate change and rising sea level, the period that we're in now is, is already anomalous. And most of the geological history of the Bahamas, sea level's been much lower, and you've had a much greater level of connectivity uh, among, among the islands. So here you, let's see. Here are the glacial interglacial cycles. If you look at the last roughly 150 million years, this marine isotope stage 5E is the highest sea level since what we have now. By the way, this is bogus. We're not 10 meters above sea level right now, or else we'd all have our swimsuits on. But, but uh, let's, let's just say we're at zero right now. But, but this is important when we're thinking about rising sea levels and biodiversity. 125,000 years ago, the plants and animals in the Bahamas were experiencing sea levels that were about four, five, six meters higher than right now. And, and so they've already been through that that bottleneck. And this is the slide, I'm going to show it to you one more time later, that really gets us going, where you can see the Great Bahama Bank with all these islands coalesced if sea level is only 35 meters lower than modern. At the glacial maximum, it was 120 meters lower than modern. So again, for most of the half million years, last half million years, this is the brown plus green plus yellow is what the Antilles looked like. Here's Florida, here's you know, Cuba, Hispaniola, Hispaniola, and you can see the Great Bahama Bank was only 20 some kilometers from Cuba. And for most of its geological history, it's been that close. And the overall land area takes on a greater Antillean uh, sort of size, pr proportion. So, People from the Greater Antilles that tell you Bahamas are wimpy little islands say, oh, not for most of the last half million years. Let them have it. All right, so we're going to focus on Abaco right here. Sawmill Sink is a site that's produced Pleistocene or Ice Age fossils, more than 10,000 years old. We also have Holocene or less than 10,000 year old fossils from Sawmill Sink, from Ralph's Cave, from Gilpin Point, and from Hole in the Wall Cave. So I'm going to look at which, spe which species of birds were here in the Pleistocene during the Ice Age, which ones didn't make it when the climate warmed up, or as far as we know they didn't make it, we have no Holocene fossils in spite of hundreds and hundreds of identified bones, and then but which ones did make it, but then winked out in the last millennium of, of human activity. So here's Sawmill Sink. It was great to hear the Prime Minister last night mention blue holes as a window into our past. There's probably no better window into our past than, than Sawmill Sink. It's, it's really changed how we think of uh, paleontology of not just the Bahamas, but the uh, West, whole West Indies. There's Brian K. Cook on the dive platform. Here's a profile of Sawmill Sink. 
I won't go into the detail here, but there's fresh water here. This is where landlubbers like me can doggy paddle around on the surface while the divers risk their lives down here collecting bones. When Brian K. Cook made the first real dive into Sawmill Sink, he found a complete shell of an extinct species of tortoise. And just in the last month now, we've retrieved an almost complete mitochondrial genome of this extinct, of this extinct tortoise. So we now can put it really tightly into the phylogeny of New World tortoises. That's another talk for another time. He also saw th things like this. Look, C1, a the skull of a Cuban crocodile. Cuban crocodiles are regarded as endemic to Cuba because they only survive in Cuba. They used to be in Hispaniola, all through the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, and this was a terrestrial carnivore that, uh, that, that have, we did the stable isotopes, it has the same stable isotope signature of carbon and nitrogen uh, as an African lion. And it was eating a lot of tortoises and rock iguanas. Uh, so these, t the fossils are collected in big Tupperwares in their original water chemistry. Here's Nancy and me looking at a, a tortoise, or a uh, crocodile skull that Brian just brought up. There's Brian. I owe all of this to people like Nancy and Brian who do the, who do the dirty work. Here's what some of these specimens look like when they're cleaned up. The organics are left, the collagen's left, you can radiocarbon date them, do stable isotopes. The anatomy is perfectly modern, so you can do any anatomical trick with them. And along with these Holocene uh, tortoise and crocodile fossils, we find bird fossils such as this. This is a complete skull of Creighton's Caracara, an extinct Caracara. Their Caracaras are large, sort of semi-terrestrial members of the falcon family. They're carrion uh, feeders. And, and so from Sawmill Sake, on the peat, the upper peat, we have this Holocene fauna. And then down deeper in the cave, near where these deep passages go off on ledges, are, are these inorganic sediments. And the inorganic sediments, here's another example of one, are filled with small bones deposited by barn owls. And so here's a living barn owl. And these, these uh, barn owl roosts are anywhere from 90 to 100 feet deep in the cave. So these barn owl roosts formed during the ice age when sea level was lower. Barn owls can't scuba down to, you know, to deposit their bones. And, and so the, the fauna that we find in these kind of sites is by default during, made during the glacial time and uh, as opposed to the, the the bones we find in peat and radiocarbon date into the Holocene. So again, when sawmills, when the barn owls were roosting in Sawmill Sink, this is what up here on Abaco, Little Bahama Bank, this is what the Bahamas look like. Very different than today. And, you know, here we are uh, screen washing some sediment from Pleistocene in Sawmill Sink. Here's Janet Franklin, a co-author, picking sediment at night. We do a lot of, uh, we have really, really exciting nights picking little bones out of, bag, out of bags of dirt. And uh, the, of the 58 species of birds we've identified from Sawmill Sink, 31 of them are no longer on Abaco. Some of them are extinct everywhere. Some of them are no longer anywhere in the Bahamas, but they're at least no longer on Abaco. Now to show you one of the Holocene sites, this is Perry Malis with me at, at at Gilpin Point, there's this unusual peat deposit at Gilpin Point, and we've radiocarbon dated the charcoal, the crocodile, the sea turtle, the extinct tortoise, all kinds of things. It's 900 years old. That charcoal influx probably represents the first burning uh, of, of that part of Abaco when Lucayans showed up. We were consistently getting these radiocarbon dates of 900, of 900 years. And like every one of these coastal archaeological sites that we've seen on the, on the Atlantic, the windward side of Abaco, the site is now underwater. Nobody has to convince me that, that, that the island is subsiding and sea levels rising. This site, in fact, is only occasionally exposed at the lowest of low tides. It's, it's, this site's often in half a meter to 80 centimeters of water. So here are some of the birds we find in the Pleistocene that aren't on Abaco anymore. 
this odd little parrot. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't have enough of it really to describe it. So this this is the living snipe that's migratory. I, so I should cross out Wilson snipe. We have an extinct endemic species of snipe there. We have a flightless rail. I showed a clapper rail just to give you an idea. Lots of bones of burrowing owls. Swainson's hawk. Short-eared owls. These are these are often open country grassland types of birds in the Pleistocene, including like grasshopper sparrow. We have both cave swallows and cliff swallows that were nesting in the cave. We have adults and juvenile bones. The most common bird we find are eastern meadowlarks, grassland indicator. We have lots of bones of eastern bluebird. We have brown-headed nuthatches, which today are only on uh, Grand Bahama. So you can make a case that it was sort of a pine, open, grassy pine woodland in the Pleistocene. At least that's what the birds would argue for. So, you know, extinction pays my bills. You know, I, I, I get paid to study extinction. But after a while, you f I feel like I'm the grim reaper. So I want to move this a little bit into more upbeat things. So here are the birds where we have fossils in the Pleistocene, in the Ice Age, fossils in the Holocene, and they're still around today. These are the survivors. Night herons, osprey, white-crowned pigeons, zenaida dove. I, sorry, that should be, say Key West quail dove. I, I was in a hurry. Uh, common ground uh, barn owl, nighthawk. These are, these are Antillean birds that we know have been here for at least, say, 20,000 20, years. And in some ways, to, especially to bird watchers, a lot of these might seem like junk birds. They're gonna, eh, you know, we, we see those all the time. Don't ever think a bird or anything else is a junk bird. In the time I've been coming down here, I've noticed that Zenaida doves, which used to be a dime a dozen almost all over the Bahamas, I can spend a week on Abaco now and never see a Zenaida dove. Nobody has a clue why, but, but we need conservation biologists, while we, you know, you have to deal with the endangered things, let's not ignore the stuff that's common now, because it might not be common in a decade or two. Here's some other ones that we have in the Pleistocene, and, you know, and now, loggerhead kingbird, Bahama yellowthroat, Spindalis, uh, you know, and the red leg thrush, bullfinch. So these include both endemic, uh, Bahamas endemic, and, and West Indian ende uh, endemic, endemic species. So we're starting to get a handle for what, you know, what's had a long history here. And we, we're also starting to get a handle on the, uh, the long-term sort of flexibility that at least a lot of birds have in, in cli with climate, because in the Pleistocene, the, it was average maybe three degrees centigrade cooler. It was definitely drier, and, and, and the, I would make a case the island was dominated by open pine grassland, a pine woodland. Coppice was probably, real, coppice was probably really rare. But if you notice, some of these birds here, are, they're, they're coppice birds. They're not pine birds, so there had to be patches of coppice, but the, the coverage through time of pineland versus coppice not, must, have, must have varied all, all over the map. And so here's, th th well, this slide is a little bit goofy. So here's 20,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Here's the ice age, and then here's this rapid increase in temperature, and by 9,000 years ago or so, this is the Holocene, and you can see temperature has fluctuated, but nothing like it did from the, from the Ice Age to the post-Ice Age. So yes, we have temperature fluctuations. Yes, there's global warming and all that, but the changes are minor compared to this big change here. So of the 31 species of birds that we have from uh, Sawmill Sink, 17 uh, that, that don't live on the island anymore, th 31 out of 58 or 9, 17 of those, as far as we know, did not survive on Abaco during that warming period, when, the hab when there were changes in habitat and the island got a lot smaller. And 14 of the, the other ones that are gone, those 14 died out probably after people come. So here, and... and just to quickly, whoops. So, you know, here, here's the last thousand, here's a thousand years ago. This is when people show up. Temperature 
you know, fluctuates and all that, but minor. So the, the extinctions that happened just a thousand years ago, we can pretty confidently blame on one sort of human impact or another. So here's, uh, yeah, so 59 species we recorded in the late Pleistocene, 17 of them we don't record in the Holocene. Of the 37, I'll, I could explain over a, a beer why those numbers don't add up. Uh, 30, but, but only with a beer. Uh, 37 of the ones that made in the Holocene, 14 of those don't make it today. And so, again, we haven't, restoration people need to maybe even think about that because of these 14 uh, species here, a lot of them are still around, still in the Antilles. If we have pr good protected land on Abaco, maybe we could, uh, we could bring some of them back. So I end on this very upbeat slide here. Three divers at Sawmill Sink, they're, they're decompressing at the last stop about 30 feet, about 30 feet deep. I all, you know, because I'm such a, a chicken and I'm waiting up on the dock, I, I always love to see the bubbles. Just love to see the bubbles. Oh, you guys, way to go. You did it. You came back. So, uh, and uh, anyway, so like I said, this is, the Bahamas project's been so much fun, and we've, I love learning about the history of these islands, and hopefully some of you conservation biologists can take some of that info and make an improved future for the islands. Thank you.